Uh, Patagonia is a very nice place in Argentina, so you should go and visit. But also, it's a conference registration system. It's sponsored by ESU, that uh, was developed by Ten Pines, the company I work with, uh, using Faro and Seaside with some jQuery stuff. Uh, on production works with Faro in the Amazon Cloud, and we use a uh, reference stream to save the data, but Gemstone would be the best solution, and uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, so you know it because that's the tool that you use to register to uh, this conference. So this is the basic registration front end. There is another functional thing is that you can have one person to register a group. I, th I think there is no secretary here, so for sure never use it. No, no one here use it. Um, and this is the administration front end. Yuri is the, you know, first user for this. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk about Patagonia, really. I'm, I'm going to talk about some design issues. So that's why I'm, I'm going fast. Mm -hmm. uh, some statistics. Uh, we have one real error in production. Uh, of course, some functional gaps. And there are not so many tests as I would like. There are some to-dos, uh, whatever. Um, it was used here for, for this conference. It has uh, licenses at MIT. You can download it from script source. It has some limitations uh, from the functional point of view, some things that could be better or could, could change. Uh, because the idea is to have a conference registration system to other, not only to ISU, for ISU, but to other, uh, any kind of uh, conference. Uh, so why? OK, why design principles with behind Patagonia? Because my idea is that we will see some design issues, OK, and also some solutions or ideas on how to solve those design issues. Okay, that's that's the whole point of the presentation. So, uh, what are some the some of the design issues I almost saw every all the times uh, that I see all the time? This is one that I for me is really important. That we we are so used to work with technical problems that we think the problem from the technical point of view and not from the business point of view. So for me, that's a very important essential design problem. Another one is we're used to have objects that do not have clear responsibility. We used to you have objects that are schizophrenic. They do 10 things at the same time. You don't know what they do, what they represent. For me, it's a very essential problem. We have others, maybe not that essential, more accidental, like Neil does not understand, blah, 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 or null pointer exceptions all the time. Yeah, it's very common for new guys, for junior developers, to have this kind of problem. Yes, and other problems that we usually see uh, on system is that business rules are not clearly modeled or they are spread around the system. For example, yesterday Esteban was giving a talk about read and he showed that he could you know, define a, a text field uh, to be required. Yeah? But that's, that's a business rule, why is required? So that business rule should be, in the, for me, in the model not in the UI. The UI should get that business rule from the model. So, well, those are the things that I see that uh, are basic design mistakes that we see every day, okay? There are more, of course. Um, so, what are the goals of the tips that I'm going to talk about today? Um, well, the idea is we should have some very simple tips to allow us to to write robust software. Software that is easy to understand, easy to change. This is uh, what everybody knows, yes? Uh, but one of the main thing about this is that I, I want computers to do more and programmers to do less. Yes? So every time we have to make a decision about you know, a design decision, I will choose computers to do more and people to do less, OK? So I won't care about performance. I won't care about uh, you know, space. I will care about, is this easier for somebody to understand or more difficult? Okay, that's the main thing, I, I guess. Um, well, you would guess, y y maybe you are asking yourself, okay, uh, are these tips good? Well, I don't know. Uh, these are based on some experience I have, developing system, teaching, object-oriented programming. Uh, and for sure, they are not applicable to any kind of system. Okay, it's more, maybe more related to business uh, kind of system. So I, I, I want to start from the beginning to I, I, I want to 
you know, talk about two things that for me are really important, like basic stuff, like axioms, okay? And let's do that. Let's try to, to play a game here and, and let's take this as, as true, okay? And see where we can go. You Maybe you won't agree with me, but let's try to do that, okay? So what is software? Software for me is a model, yeah, that you create understanding the problem domain through a paradigm, in this case, object-oriented paradigm, and you know, you express in a computable model. So software is a computable model of a domain problem. Yeah? Nothing new. So what's software development? A lot of people think that software development is knowledge acquisition and representation. Yeah? So it software development is really a learning process. Yeah? Nothing new here either. But for me, these two things are very important to understand what good design is, or, or, or for example, uh, oh sorry, uh, what I think that good design is, okay? So in the process of software development, the most difficult task is to go from a natural language representation of the problem domain to a uh, formal language representation that has to be complete, explicit, etc. Yeah, that's the main issue that you always face when you are designing, when you are programming. So for example, in Patagonia, one of the requirements is um, we cannot have two conferences with the same name. Yeah? That's a requirement. Also, we cannot have two talks with the same names I mean, I mean because we are talking about the same talk. Yeah? So how do you solve this problem? <coughs> yeah? We have names for the conference. We have names for the talk. So yes, and those names should not be case sensitive when you compare them. Should not, they shouldn't care about blanks. Yeah? They cannot be empty. They have some restriction. So how do you solve this problem? How, how do you model these constraints? So for most people, or for junior programmers usually, they say, okay, let's do it with strings. I mean, there are just strings. Yeah, a name is a string. Well, I think, uh, no, I think that that you know, kind of knowledge deserves to have a special class. Yes. I, I would like to represent that kind of, uh, you know, that knowledge in one class. And that's what I did in Patagonia, and we call it name. Yeah? A name is a string that when you compare two names, they, they are not case sensitive, they don't care about blanks, they cannot be empty, and that is, you know, uh, abstracted in a class called pat name. <coughs> Another example, are symbols the same as selectors. <laughs> this was a discussion in the Faro list that Stefan fired like two weeks ago. Yeah? Um, so for me, they are not the same. <coughs> Symbols have some meaning. Main one is that they are unique. And some symbols, some symbols are selectors. Some, not all of them. So if we think about this solution from the knowledge representation point of view is not good. They're using one class to represent two different things. Because if you remove these methods from selector, from those objects that represent, uh, sorry, from symbols, from those objects that are really symbols, the question is, are they still symbols or not? And the answer is yes, they're still symbols. That, I mean, they don't need to answer is binary precedence or whatever because they are symbols, they are not selectors. So <coughs> here we can, I, I like what Sun Super E says, you know, a designer knows he has achieved perfection, not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And here we, we see an example where we can take, where we can remove these selectors, these messages from symbol and still represent symbols. So I think that a better design would be to have two different classes like unique string and message name, not even select or message name or something like that, okay? So that leads us to my first tip. Um, no, sorry, so wha what's, why is that? Because I don't, want, I don't want the programmer to think every time he sees a symbol, an instance of a symbol, is this really a symbol or is this a selector, yeah? If he, if he does that, He's, we're taking time from him that could be in the computer, yeah? So the idea is 
the computer should have all that information. We shouldn't um, ask programmers to think about that all the time. So I want programmers to think less, mm, and I want programmers to do less and computers to do more. Mm. So first tip, don't be afraid of creating classes. Yeah, sometimes people think, oh no, there's too many classes. And the idea is to have, to try to have an isomorphism between the concepts on the problem domain and uh, the abstractions that you create, the classes. Yeah, so for me it's very important to try to have this isomorphism. And, uh, and then we have, of course, implementations detail. Yeah, like, okay, but I have two dates from, for the, to represent the same date. Okay, that's not a problem. That's an implementation detail. But from the conceptual point of view, from the knowledge representation point of view, it is good to have this one-to-one -one mapping. <coughs> so no two classes to represent the same concept. This is not common. We usually have the other thing. We have one class to represent more than one concept. <coughs> For example, uh, symbol is used to represent dates. Sorry, days, yes? in small dot daily. Numbers represent a lot of things. They represent years, they represent, uh, I don't know, amounts of money, anything. <coughs> Strings are used to represent things that have some meaning besides being strings, yes? So, conclusion, I'm not saying that you have to create a class for each role that you see that an object can have in a special context and saying we should have classes for each concept that you see that is important to represent in your model and that will make clear or more simple your design. And some people say, oh, well, more classes means more complexity. And when you know, people tell me that, I say, remember what Alan Kay said, it's everything about the verbs. Yeah, it's everything about how, m you know, the, the messages that you, you have. That's what, that's, I think, the most important measure of complexity. Yeah? And if we go to the symbol selector uh, discussion and we create those two classes, we are not adding more verbs. We're just moving verbs from one class to the other. So we are not having a more complex solution. Yeah? Verbs, messages are the same. <coughs> so, conclusion, for me this is very important because it gives you a be better uh, classes, more functional. Um, there is some direct mapping between the model and the problem domain, yes, easier to understand. And uh, this is one of the first things that when I teach to guys that work with Java, with C Sharp, you know, or any language, uh, they they, you know, they don't see these things at, at the beginning. When, when they start thinking about modeling concepts and, and using classes to model concepts, it's like a, a big hit for them. <coughs> so now I'm going to talk about another problem. is how do we create objects? The classic way of creating objects is, you know, this is small talk aid, you know, not this is not far anymore. Uh, we create an instance of a class then we send messages to set the instance variables of that object. Yes, but during that time, that object is incomplete. So if somebody sends the message sleep to this date, between these two messages, that they will s you know, raise an error because it's not complete. He cannot know if it is leap or not because it doesn't have the year number. So that object becomes complete after the last set. So this has a lot of disadvantages, yes? The first one is that the responsibility of completing the object is not in the object itself, but in the ones that are using the object. So it's difficult to maintain. Um, there is a time, time span where that object is invalid, yeah? And programmers have to think, can I send this message now? 
is, is it valid to send the message now or not? So what I propose is to create objects, valid ob uh, complete objects from the beginning. So instead of sending the message new and then setters, just create the object, the complete object with all its instance variables with all its collaborators from the beginning. <coughs> so when you do that, that date is not reachable from anywhere because it's just being created. And after creating the object, right after that, the object is complete. There is no problem to send any message to it after you have the object. Yes? So second tip that I think is important is object must be complete since their creation time. Yes. No. Uh, my question is about uh, concurrency. Uh, your creation is still not atomic, and if you use, uh, you ask the class for all its instances, you can end up with uh, in another thread. You can end up with a reference on your object in the middle while it is. Yeah, in yeah, of course. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm I'm not saying that this is going to work. If, if you do those kind of things, meta programming stuff, I mean, this is not the best solution. But we don't usually do that, and I think this is good enough. Okay, and if you create a culture about this, the idea is to create a culture about these tips that will allow you to make less mistakes. But yeah, that's true, it's completely true. It doesn't solve that problem. So, but the idea is create complete objects since the its first time, okay, since its creation time. So for example, in, in Patagonia, but attendee is a class that I don't like, it's too big, but anyway, and, and the name, I don't like the name, but it's there. This is the one that represents that somebody registered. It should be called register information instead of attendee because you don't know if somebody that re is register is going to attend the conference really. So, but anyway, uh, this is the uh, instance creation method that receives all all the objects that it needs to be complete. Okay, it receives it and it uh, creates the instance and initializes the instance with all those objects. Very simple. This is another example, the conference. The conference can, uh, I mean, can be created with just a conference configuration or also with something that's called the time system. I'm gonna talk about that later. That could be a real time system or a test time system, but you provide instance creation messages that all the instance creation messages will send one, yeah, I mean, there's going to be just one real instance creation message, okay? That's going to do the new and the initialize. Very simple. Well, what are the advantages of doing this? The first advantage is that objects will always answer when you send them a message. Will ne you will never get a nil does not understand. You will never have to think about, hmm, is this a good time? Can I send this message? Yes? <coughs> so you always have objects that are complete. And it's an easy implementation. You know, having this rule is very easy. <coughs> so you may ask, well, okay, but what happens when I have objects that I cannot create? W I, I don't know all the information to create that object when I want to create it. Well, my advice is maybe if you cannot create that object with all the information it needs, Maybe you should think about having more than one object. Maybe the problem is that that object should be divided by two or three. Yes, and I'm gonna give an example about it. <coughs> okay, so we have objects that are complete, but are they valid? Are they valid objects? So the question is, should we check that objects are valid? Do we care that when we are you know, writing a design, do we care that objects are valid? When I say valid, I mean that they represent something of the domain problem, yes? I mean, that's, if, if you think that an object is a representation of an entity of the problem domain, so what does an invalid object represent? 
So um, my question to that is, no, we shouldn't have invalid objects to six. I think that objects should be self-defensive, yes? I think that objects should uh, keep you from doing mistakes when you want to use them, when you want to create them, yes? <coughs> so where, who is the who has the responsibility of assuring that an object is valid? We can think about different options. One is, okay, every time you create the object, you have to do it yourself. That's not a good solution. We can put that in the UI. That's a not a good solution either, yes? I mean, the UI is not responsible of creating valid objects. I think the best solution is to give that responsibility to the object that creates objects. So if we have classes that their responsibility is to create objects, so why don't we give that responsibility to the classes, okay? So here we have an example of that. A fee is how much the conference is gonna charge you. Yeah, but fee is that. And this is the instance creation message that says for all days is that fee, for one day is another fee. And what are the business rules that make a fee valid. The first thing is that the all-day fee has to be positive. Yeah? If not, the conference is gonna pay you instead of you paying the conference. <laughs> the one-day fee also has to be positive. But another thing is that the all-day fee has to be greater than one-day fee because if not, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to pay more for, the, you know, for one day than for the whole days. So those are the rules that I think make a fee valid. If you try to create a fee without uh, this, I mean, with, with for example, with a, a negative number, you won't get a valid fee. So what do I do? I check that, like, preconditions, yes? Each assertion is um, an object that verifies that the assertion is hold. The assertions are run before you actually create the object. If everything works fine, if all the preconditions hold, then the object gets created. So that way, you always have not only complete but valid objects, yes? Of course, this is an implementation detail. You could use another precondition frameworks or whatever. <coughs> So my first tip would be create only valid objects. Not only complete, but only valid. Yes? So what are the advantages? Well, we only have valid objects in our system. <coughs> and the good thing about this is that the model tells us every time we make a mistake and we can learn from that. And that's very important in a group development kind of development, yes? When you have new people coming to your group to work, it's very nice, it's very good for the model to teach them, you know? You don't have to explain to them when a fee is valid. If they create a fee and they make a mistake, the system will tell them, hey, this is not a valid fee. The information is in the system. <coughs> it's easy to use and to implement. These are some of the business rules. They are not all the business rules. We'll see more later. And of course, we can do meta programming on those things because we have the assertions that are verified. We can check for all the uh, different preconditions that an object has. So now we have objects that are complete always, we have only valid objects, always, yes? So now we can start thinking about the consequences of this. The first one that I would like to you to think of is, do we need nil? Do we need to use nil? What do you think? If we only have complete objects, and those objects are valid, do we need nil? So the answer is no, we don't need it. No for these objects. 
Yeah, so imagine, yeah, imagine a, a world without Neo, yeah? It's easy if you try. <laughs> you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one, yeah? Uh, Tony Hoare gave a talk about this like two or three years ago that he called it Null References, the Billion Dollar Mistake. It's a very interesting talk. Yes. Yes, so no new. Uh, so it's good to have uh, things like that with the null object pattern. Do not use the abstract name. That's something that Leandro taught me. That's very good advice. Other things to think about: can we can we have an image without new? Well, I'm going to pass fast. This this is an open question for you. Um, another consequences of this idea is. Um, can we use the assertions description to show that to the user? Can we avoid this type of problems? You know, error messages that doesn't mean anything. So yes, we, ca we can use the same error description to show that in the UI. Yet this is an example of, if you look at of the, I mean, the assertions that I show you about the fee that are not being held, okay? It's very easy to do that in the UI. The idea is to have a composite model holder where you say, come on, you say, if this assertion is not whole, show that in this model holder. If this assertion doesn't hold, show, you know, show that in that model holder. And it's very easy to, to implement, to write. I mean, you don't have to write all the things I, you know, we have small talk, so small talk does it for you. Um, how this uh, works with test, well, the idea is to make it pretty easy to uh, test and handle those kind of assertions, but, but more consequences. Okay, we don't need nil. What about setters? Do we need setters? Yeah, wha what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is that we don't need setters. If we have this kind of objects, we shouldn't use setters anymore because that can create invalid objects. So the first thing is think about the mutable objects. That's good. I'm going to go fast. Um, okay. Sorry. I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. I thought because it's 12, 10 to 12. Cool, thank you. Thank you. So, so, okay, so the, the idea is, okay, you're, s you're telling us not to have setters and, and to use immutable objects, but some things change. So how do you solve that problem? So one, one advice is, for example, this is a bad solution for, to represent an invoice. An invoice in Argentina at least cannot be changed when you give it to the, to the customer, yes? So here, we, we create an invoice, we give the invoice to the customer, but nothing prevents us to send a new message to the invoice and to change it. So that's not a good model. And a good solution, from my point of view, would be to have two different objects. One to represent the form, the invoice form, like a builder, that is the one that you can change. And then you say, tier, okay, I'm taking out the invoice from the form, and after that, I create the invoice. And after that, the, the, the form cannot change. And of course, an invoice will not answer that message because it's an immutable object. It cannot change. Yeah? It's a very simple solution. Another one is this one that's very complex. I'm not going to talk about it. But another solution is, OK, it, what, what happens if we want to use the same object to change? So the classic uh, solution is to use setters. But the problem with that is the same problem that we saw when we create objects. There is some time here between one set and another set that the object is invalid. Yes, I'm saying that this stock has dollar as a currency, but the issue amount is in pesos. 
So it's an invalid object. So what could be another solution? Another solution could be, okay, create a valid stock. If you want to change the stock, create another one that is valid, and then just synchronize the old one with the new one at once in one message. So what you have there, you have a valid object, because you only can have valid objects, and then you synchronize your current stock that is valid with a new one that continue that is valid too. So no problem. Yes? <coughs> so tips tip number six, change objects, synchronize it at once. Yeah, I think that's a good idea too. Um, so how this work? You create new objects to reflect changes, you synchronize them, uh, always the objects are always valid, no setters, the UI is very simple because every time you have a model holder where you set the value, the model holder asks to, um, to the real model its values, and when you want to change a model, you know, somebody's going to ask the model holder for its value, that will work with all its composite model holders. It's going to create a new object that this one is going to be valid, and then it's going to return it, and somebody's going to synchronize that. So that means that you don't need a special copy of objects, you don't need a special buffering, or those kind of things to handle cancels or to handle errors. Yes? You only synchronize objects when they are valid. And another good thing about this is the business rules are always in the objects. Yes. Yes. Hernan, uh, isn't it that, uh, I mean, th the real problem is that you are missing transactions. Could it no. be the right solution? Because you want to do atomic change on objects and you don't want to have the change be valid and you can want to roll back. No, 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 I'm not missing transaction because you can use this model with gemstone. Think about transactional memory. I, I use this with gemstone and work pretty well. I mean, pretty well. Th because the transaction is is not only to for one object. I I'm, I think the transaction as a business transaction. So when you want to roll back, if you have transactional memory like gemstone, you don't have any problem with this. We we can discuss that later. Yeah, but I you know I I use it with gemstone. There's no problem. And in Faro, it's working like that. <laughs> okay, so another thing that it's important for me to think of is, okay, you, we have these objects, we have the fee, we have the attendee, but how are they valid in a system? Not only by itself, but in a system. Is there are rules that make that object valid or invalid in a context? So the idea is that yes, we should model that I suggest to model that with something I call subsystems that are the objects that will handle you know when a set of objects is valid in the system so my, my last one <laughs> my last one is to model system architecture and its business rules yes so for example in Patagonia there is a par and system that's a system that handles and this and when you want to add a register, an RMD, all these assertions are run and because they, you want to be sure that you are registering an attendee for a valid user, that the attendee, that the user is not, does not have another attendee, yes? Uh, I don't know, the reduction ticket is valid, that the country that you're setting is valid, etc. When all those things hold, then you really add the attendee. And another example is if you want to modify an attendee, the same idea. You just check that that new attendee that you're going to apply to the current one is valid in the system, and if it is, you just change it. So the basic, the, it's, it's almost the same idea. So this is very important for concurrency. <laughs> um, and it's very important to check everything because you could say, oh, come on, you have the UI. The UI is always going to give you a valid user. You don't have to check that in the model. Well, 
That's true now. Somebody could change the UI and made a mistake. And the other thing is the UI is not the only interface of your system. It could have a REST interface, web service interface. So, for example, here I check that the when you submit a talk, that the talk was created by an attendee. And you could say, oh, but this is absurd. You are checking again something that is already valid. But no, if you have concurrency, it could happen that you could get an ad a talk that is invalid in the system. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this. So advantages, objects are all in com always complete, always valid. You have systems that also check that objects are valid in the context of the system. Yes? And you have one system that is the, the main one. It's going to be the root for all the your system. And for example, if you use gemstone, it's going to be the root for your persistence. Yes? And you can do meta programming on the, your system architecture. Okay, you could decide this system is not going to run here, it's going to be distributed. Or, for example, uh, I want to have different implementations of this authentication system. Yes? I want to use LDAP or Active Directory, whatever. <coughs> uh, and, and a good thing about this is, um, for example, I model something that I call the time system. Time system has the responsibility to give you the time. S and the, the why is that? Because when you're testing, sometimes you need to move the time to be sure that the system is working correctly while the time passes. So time system has two implementations, the real one and the test one. And when we want to test something like this that says talks cannot be submitted after submission deadline, your yeah, talk cannot be submitted when the deadline is over, how do we, how do we test this? So well, we create the conference, blah, blah, and then we change the, the time in the test time system. Yeah, it's a setter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to be strict, but not that much. <laughs> but the, the good thing about this is um, you can also handle this kind of thing that's uh, very difficult to test. I mean, you, you, you can make time passes forward and backward to, to do whatever you need in, in your test. Um, okay. There are more things to talk about, or should I run out of time? <laughs> <laughs> so these are the tips. Um, I, I think it's, uh, I, you know, I have been working for with these tips for uh, like six, six years. They work pretty fine. They're very, very useful for young people, for junior programmers. Uh, and it's very interesting to create a culture, development culture about it, and uh, around it, around those tips, and of course, use uh, tests to validate that those tips are being used. Okay, so, and if you follow, you follow tho those tips, um, if you follow those tips, uh, those tips, uh, you will sleep tight and you will have just one error. Nobody understood the joke. <laughs> okay, question. Thanks. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, as we saw in one of the last um, code snippets you gave, I, I'd like to weaken your tip on not using setters. Okay. Um, I'd like to weaken it, not do not use setters except for tests, because in tests you it's uh, incidentally, I use setters nearly only in initializers and in tests because you want to exchange the things there. Probably you ne need setters in your system or in your XM system only for tests. Uh, I didn't have that need for uh, business objects. Okay. Um, I, one system that we developed that has already 23,000 tests, 23,000 unit tests, um, uh, that is using those tips, we didn't have to use it. So I, I'm not saying that it's good or bad. We we didn't need. It. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mine was almost exactly the same. I've certainly encountered situations where I don't want the system to have any setter access to a certain thing, 
but it's very hard to test that the condition at a certain point is right unless you have an extension in your test uh, package that loads that raw setter, which I always name with some kind of very aggressive don't use this except for test. So yeah, well, OK. Yeah, uh, and then uh, about the the usage of nil. Yeah, uh, I think that we use nil because it's uh, easy. I mean, it's the easier than building the, the null object pattern. Do you have some thing to help people use the null object pattern? I believe it's 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 a it's a right solution, but I mean it requires some effort compared yeah. to simply I mean using nil. Yeah, I mean, like always, it's a trade-off. Um, it's a trade-off. Um, nil is handy because it's very easy. You put nil, but then you can have problems because you have to do is nearly true and you can forget to do it and for sure new people new programmers will forget to do it uh, so I think it's worth the time to think about what it means for something to not be there and try to you know conceptualize that I think it's worth the time you know uh, but this is a tip it's not a rule okay so I sometimes, excuse me? But, uh, no, no, sorry, I, I didn't understand. Oh, no, no, I don't have a tool. Yeah, no, no, no. But, what, for example, what we do uh, in a system that, that is using gemstone, yeah, when, when you change from one version to another, you have to migrate objects. Yeah, let's say you have to migrate objects. How are we sure that the migration was correctly done? we check if an object has nil as an instance variable. If it has nil, we know that the migration was not correct because no object can have a nil in an instance variable. Of course, that doesn't mean that the migration was uh, right, but if you have nil in an object, you are sure that the migration was not right, okay? So, you know, it's, it's a nice tip, yeah. In the beginning of the presentation, you said uh, that you have an isomorphism yeah. between uh, reality and your domain. Uh, no, the model, the classes, and the concepts of the domain. Yeah. There are sometimes in the model you have more classes than your. Yeah. Okay. Because of implementation details. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> the yeah. second one. Uh, Related with the the setters, and um, you think about, and I know this is controversial, um, like uh, public and private uh, methods. It's a solution for that. No, no, because you can write good systems without that, and I think it adds an accidental complexity that you don't really need. Okay, and the last question. Yeah, I, that's my point. Okay. I know. Um, use this uh, with uh, TDD. Yes. And was practical. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. I I, w I only develop using TDD as, uh, and I use these tips. Great. Yeah. Another question there. Uh, from my own experience, uh, using a, a long uh, uh, initialization methods with uh, a lot of arguments is that sometimes you you want to use different uh, initialization order so you uh, ne first need you need to evaluate first parameter then second and in another case you need to first evaluate second parameter and only then first and uh, with uh, patterns that you presented i i'm always stuck with single uh, with a single initialization order mm -hmm. so when you have uh, two parameters you have to add two methods to no no to i mean no no you can initialize the parameters in local variables in the way that you want and then send one message i mean yes, but what 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 when you have three parameters Same you thing. can initialize them in uh, six uh, different no, ways. No, no. First, second, third, th or third, second, first, and vice versa. Okay. I'll you see? It maybe, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe I don't understand your question, but I, I, I see no problem there. I uh, mean, I mean you create the objects in the way and in the order that you want. You create them, and then you send the message, the, the instance creation message with the objects that you created in the order that you want. Why, why are you going to need more than one instance creation message? Because uh, at some point I, I uh, could have enough data for passing the first parameter. Okay, but so well, that's, that's what I said. So what I said a tip was, if you don't have enough data, the enough objects to create that object that you want, following these tips means that that object, sh I mean, maybe it's better to break that object in two. But okay? then and when, because if you don't have all the objects that you need to create that object, there is an event that is going to give you that information, and you should model that event with a new object. Okay, okay? but then you have some super object which uh, links to all the uh, mm. mini object you created to hold them in one in one uh, no, no. entity. No, no, why? Why one super object? Because I mean otherwise, if you have a relation between two objects which represent uh, your single concept in your model, because you told that I mean, when you create a new one, you forget about the old one. I mean, but yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah, because it's more like an implementation detail, I think. It's not really a question. So, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. And just one would like to comment on some things that um, I think this kind of rule is really important to increase the quality of, of, of the code. So if I may recommend some books, there is the um, object-oriented heuristics from Arthur Real that gives about 60 heuristics on how to improve the code. I wrote a lecture on that, so I can give this lecture to anyone who wants. And also a second book that I really enjoyed and I found really useful to increase the quality. The code is uh, the one of um, Martin Roberts on Agile Software Development. That's all. Cool. Um, in your presentation, um, you, you'd express the requirement that only valid objects exist in the system, and you validate the assertions at the time of object creation and configuration by your initialization methods. Um, how do you handle the rule changes in a sense that, you know, if you have an object in structure A and the rule changes to change those conditions, it might be that the objects that you created yesterday are no longer valid according to the rules that are today. Do you need to recreate them and pass them through the initialization to catch those assertions? And then how do you change them from no longer being valid to being valid again to fit your model of only having valid objects in the system. Yeah, 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 that's true. I mean, but that's how it works. I mean, um, if a rule, a business rule, does not hold anymore and make an object that you th it was valid before being valid today, then it's good to have those assertions because you will find easily those objects that are now invalid with the new business rule. So, and, but. Well, would you need to go through all your objects and try to recreate them to find out if they're valid again? Well, that, your it's question was, your validation only so, sorry, because your question was that, what happens if you add a new business rule or if you remove a business rule? Well, it doesn't matter, I mean. We, we well, if you add a business rule, then you can have invalid objects. If you remove a business rule, you won't have an inv new invalid objects the objects that are valid now will continue to be invalid. So the problem is, what happens if you change a business rule or you add a business rule? Yes, so then if you add a business rule, let's say you add a new business rule, then you have to be sure that the objects that you have in the system are valid with that new business rule. And what to do with the ones that are invalid? I don't know, tell the, the, uh, the system um, owner, hey, you gave me this business rule, but we have all these objects, all these customers, for example, that became invalid. What do we do? What happens sometimes when in that situation is that the, the, the user will say, oh, I forgot about that condition. So the system is telling you know, the, uh, the user about how to think about the system. 
No, but I guess in the running system, once you have a million customers and you yeah. add the requirement that they all have a birthday, and up until now you have 10 years worth of customers that didn't specify a birthday, what do you do? I mean, you ultimately have to design the system so yeah. that those customers continue to exist yeah. and continue to be valid, even though your new rule says that customer is not valid without a birth date. So... Okay, you will have to provide, in that case, in let's talk about implementation, in the instance variable that is the date of birth, an object that says, I don't know, not nil, of course, but an object that represents that I don't have a business day, you know, a, a, a birthday day, a birthday. Because that is, that is what, that's what's happening. I mean, you have those objects, those customers, you don't know the birthday, so what do you do? You put an object that represents that you don't know the birthday. So do you still consider them valid, I guess, is what I was trying and to And it's say. a valid object, of course it's a valid object. Why not? Even though if you try to create it today... But because, it be because you know, if that happens to me, I will go to the user and ask him, hey, what do we do with all the customers that we don't know the birthday? And he will have to decide. And for sure he will say, well, we don't care about it. Okay, so I will model that we don't care about it. Okay. Thank you. And it's lunch now, and the next session.